And again, it's so important. There's, there's always something I say that we have the world versus word phenomena. And we try to please the world versus the word. And I was at home washing the dishes one morning. Hold on, you can't just run past that. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you ain't gonna just keep running past these gyms you uh, dropping. We're Jamaicans, we run fast. You gotta keep I up. I know, I'm trying to. I'm trying to Usain Bolt this thing. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep up. You said we try to please the world and not the word. Yeah. And the difference is just an L. That's right. That's right. And you take an L when you try to please come on, the come world. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. I never imagined my public healing would inspire others to heal across the world. I thank you for using him to reach the world with the message of hope in relationships. But your life does not. God, you are my publicist. We laugh. <laughs> we share the unadulterated truth. He said, not only have I not divorced you, I ain't exposed you. Oh. We didn't marry fans, we married forever. And we wanted forever to act like a fan. Reveal her, Jesus. I will not compromise mm -mm. on getting a woman of God. You don't have to. And Father, I declare for his future wifey. Thank you for preserving her. This season, I declare miracles and manifestations. See, you're selling scripts. And you're unique. You ain't like nobody else. I, I noticed that right away. You being true to who you are, you're going to attract. Mm. It's a Hebrew word, chayil, and it was translated wealth, and it means people, it means men, it means resources, and it means means. I'm Lateris R. Whitfield, and this is the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. We here now, y'all. We, we are in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Man, this is absolutely awesome. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Latera Star Whitfield. We are in Mo Bay, Jamaica, having an amazing time. We have about 120 people who have traveled all the way to Montego Bay, all across the world. And uh, we're gonna have an amazing time. Hold on. Are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, come on, hit that subscription button and subscribe. Can we get a commitment? You know, uh, this is a time for miracles and manifestation. A lot of y'all are believing God to do some amazing things in your life, and we're going to keep on believing. And most of the times, I do about 21 episodes for each season, but God laid on my heart to do 33 episodes in season six. The number 33 for y'all that don't stand. So I think we got some believers in the house right now. The number 33 is when Jesus Christ died. And so that was the ultimate miracle. It was the ultimate sacrifice. And so we're going to go ahead and rise season six to episode 33. Um, but listen, we have an amazing couple on the podcast today. So without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. My new homies, Basilia and Ryan Cuff. Y'all give it up for them, y'all. So how y'all doing? <laughs> how y'all doing? We're good. We're wonderful. Thank you. You have to look for him to ask how he's doing first. <laughs> well, I was looking at him to see if he's going to answer first. And it's Brian. Oh, Brian. Yes. I say Ryan. Yes, Brian. My bad. That's, That's okay. Fine. Brian. That's fine. You good? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, we're going to jump right on in here. When I talk to y'all and I ask what would be the title of y'all's episode, um, and you gave me some food for thought, and I said, we're going to call this episode, Almost Didn't Make It. <laughs> Almost Didn't Make It. Um, why do you say that, Brian? Well, earlier, before we started, you were playing the song, Never Would Have Made It Without You, and that's my jam, you know? Um, even before we got married, she's a radio broadcaster, and I used to call in and request that song every Saturday during her show. And it stands out for me because even before we got together, um, I was struggling with a lot of situations, especially with my mom being unwell, and that carried over to our relationship. And it was one of the reasons why we almost never got married in the first place. And then after that, we had a, a, an interesting situation where we were living apart for two years. Um, and three. Three years. <laughs> she said, yeah, she said let's men, be men, clear, you know how three. it go. You know how it go, men. <laughs> We don't know dates. We don't do dates. But yeah. And it really stretched us until we almost gave up. But God had his hand on our life. 
Good, good. Look at her. She, she did a little shimmy right there. She said God had a hand. So um, did you feel the effects of, you said his mom was struggling with illness or whatnot. He said that it almost caused y'all not to get married. Did you ever feel the effects of that and how? Listen, now or back then? No, back then. then. What were you thinking? Back then, I was wondering, what did I get myself into? Literally because I could not understand what he was going through. And every time I tried to find out, all right, how can I help? How can I be there a little more? He would say, this is something I have to do. And I couldn't understand because we dated for four years before we got married for long, 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 <laughs> long years. No, but Celia, you got to put this in perspective. Y'all met at what age? We met at, I was 20, and he was, what, 21, 22, and... Uh, it's a long time, so from 21 to 25. Yes, 21 to 25 is a long time, especially because we both got married as virgins, so we wanted oh, that's to... That's what made it so long. Yes. Come on, somebody. <laughs> oh, well, she said it took a long time. Because, because honestly, <laughs> after, after dating for two years, I felt like, that. Oh, what else are we going to do? We went to every restaurant we knew. We watched every we movie. We watched every movie that we could watch. So it was almost like, okay, um, what's next, Jesus? <laughs> and I said to him, like, two years in, I'm like, babe, uh, okay. Because I knew he was my husband, six months after meeting him, I got my confirmation very early, before we even started dating. I think that's why it was so long for me. Because I knew that he was my husband, but he did not get his confirmation. But what I did was I did not tell him that I got my confirmation. Because I wanted him to not feel pressured by me having, you know... I don't think I had a better relationship with God than him, but I think in that situation, God knew that he needed to give me that confirmation at that time because of my position and because, you know, of everything that was happening in my life. So I knew he was my husband before we started dating. So imagine waiting four years and you know that this man is yours. I'm like, Father God, help me. <laughs> so I, I, I felt the effects of his situation because I couldn't understand and every time I tried to understand, he would shut down. And I'm like, I, I don't know how to do this. And so that was a really sore point of our, our dating life. That's good. I'm glad that you said you didn't tell them that early. Uh, you always hear me say that um, a woman should present and not persuade. Well, persuade. Present and Pers not pursue. Yes. And a man. Y'all finna say it? Yes, sir. Hold on. Yes, sir. Hold on. No, let me yes, ask y'all. <laughs> Hold on. So y'all tell me what I say. What do I say? But not pursue. And a man should do what? Pursue that. that a man should pursue and not persuade. Yeah. And so what you said, I presented myself. God has confirmed that this is my, my husband, and I'm just going to wait. I actually told him one year after we got married. A year after that. So you I had told him that five years. Told you. I told him five years after I met him that I got my confirmation six months after meeting him before we started dating again because I needed for God to give him his own conviction. I didn't want him to feel like, oh, okay, she knows that I'm her husband. Okay, let me try and find this confirmation from somewhere. And he got it four years into us dating for long, long, long years. time. <laughs> Long time. So, Brian, four years later, what did you hear God say to you? All right, so it's interesting. As I said, my mom hasn't been well, and my father left when I was 13 years old. He left for the States to make things better. But, you know, being absent made things worse. And it's one of the, the things that I hold on to, to be there for my children versus providing, which is something we're told in Jamaica. You know, men are providers, so that's what he did. But he left a gap. And she got ill. So let me be clear. You said he left to do what? To go work somewhere? To, to go work in the States, yeah. And uh, over time, she got ill. She had a heart condition. She did open heart surgery. She had depressive episodes. She had strokes. And my brother got married. He left. And I was the only one left. So for me, I wanted to be there for her. I knew that some of her best friends had died as well. And I knew that she was losing everything around her. So I felt it was part of my duty to not leave her. So, yeah. I mean, that comes with a lot of baggage as well and trauma because I was watching life slip away from me by being there for my mother. And it's interesting. I was at work one night. Um, 
Work was finished, but I was watching the TV. I hope my former bosses don't. Yeah. <laughs> I was watching the TV, and it was a Madea show. And Madea goes to jail. And in it, she was, yeah, yeah. She was talking to somebody that addressed my whole situation. She was asking the person, why is she not in a relationship? And she said, because she's doing it for her mom. And Madea said, that's selfish. And I was like, that's me. And she explained that your mother would want you to be happy and not for you to put your life on hold for her. And Jamaican men, big man thing, cry in the office. <laughs> Nobody was seeing me, so I never feel too bad because we're cultured not to cry. Yeah. Um, and when I was crying, it was confirmation for me that my mother wants me to be happy. <laughs> yeah, and, and four years, four she years came to break out praise dance right now. <laughs> she said, hallelujah, God, yeah. we bless your yeah. name right now. But, but it's interesting. Before that happened, I had asked her, for an extension on the four years. <laughs> he asked me for, this is four years in, for five additional years to wait for him. Five, five. I'm, like, I'm like, sir, I am not a mortgage on a house. <laughs> no, thank you. No, uh-uh. And, and one of the reasons why I said that, because we are both in ministry and I knew. And sometimes, you know, we need to just understand ourselves and understand yep, our flesh. Yeah. I knew I that. Wait no, five no, uh, yeah. no, I, I will wait no way. Somebody going to fall. Yeah. And so it would both probably of us. be. Both yeah, of us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so for me, from a ministry perspective, I knew that we couldn't continue like this. Because I knew that we were going to get in trouble. And I think sometimes we play superhuman and be like, oh, we it's have strong. the spirit. Yeah. We do, but we also have the flesh. Yeah. And we Come have on. to understand that yeah. and not put ourselves in certain situations. So I was willing to walk away at that time until he was ready. I was willing to walk away because I knew he was my husband. But we couldn't continue dating and we were working together. He was my supervisor at the time. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. And no, we, no, nobody, no, knew. Nobody, nobody knew. Nobody knew. For the, the story sweet bad, right? So nobody knew that we were dating for those four years. He was my supervisor. We were in the same department. Yeah, I was very professional about it. Very that. professional. <laughs> so professional that he was harder on me than everybody else. And, you know, that dating in the workplace as a whole other, that yeah. was a full-time job. I'm like having three, four jobs. That was a whole full-time job. And, you know, we said to each other, if we're going to do this, then we have to be professional about it. That's right. But, yeah, we, we, we definitely got things rolling after he got his confirmation. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Amen. And so when you asked for a five-year extension, why did you come up with five years? I think as men, we, we try to plan things out. You know, we are fixers. And I wanted to fix my mom and fix situations around her. And I believe that that would have given me enough time to accumulate certain things so that I could take care of mom and then take unto myself a wife. Did you voice that to her? Did you say this five-year extension is due to, or did you just say I, give I me didn't. five years? I didn't because in my head, and this is where expectations versus reality, in my head she knew what I was going through. So when I said it to her, she should have just understood at the time what it was for. See, that's where we, that's where we go so wrong yeah. because we expect somebody to meet some unmet expectations that that's we right. didn't communicate. That's right. Where you could have gave her another place of reference and yeah. understanding to say, hey, listen, this is where I'm at. And yeah. Especially when you're doing life together, yes, that it's a partnership. So you should say, hey, listen, this is where I'm at. Yeah. And then let her help to navigate that or say, you know what, that's not going to work for me. Instead of just saying, give me five years. Because a lot of men, as you know, is that they're not trying to rush to get married. So they'll just string you along for seven, eight, 10, 15 years. <laughs> then y'all break up and then yeah. they'll go meet somebody else and marry her in three months. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so... Unfortunately, that's why I say we have to be better communicators. And, Agreed. you know, as men, we're not, a lot of us are not trained to communicate. That's right. That's, that's right. why I love about the Dear Future Wifey podcast is, um, oh, uh, shout out to Soyini. Soyini uh, is my, uh, give her a round of applause. Big that's, up, that's, Soyini. That's my, uh, Soyini is my, she's my uh, Jamaica uh, connect. And I said, she said, listen, I make sure that guys that I get ready to date, they have to watch the Dear Future Wifey podcast. She said, because... 
The Jamaican men don't want to communicate. They don't have no emotions. She says she's heard testimonies from guys that say, what? I can actually show my emotions. I can actually have feelings. I see this other dude over here crying on the episode. You know, like, what is, what is this about? And you touched on this earlier. Why do you say that? And this is men kind of across the world where we're not taught that we can be vulnerable emotionally. But talk about it from a Jamaican culture. How was that ingrained in you as a young boy? Uh, so I grew up with my brother, so it's two boys, mommy had two boys and my father and in the household and even in a wider context, you know, from where little boys, when boys are playing and boys fall down, nobody pays them any mind, you know, when the boy starts to cry, you know, I'm going to use the patois, yeah, what, what are you crying for? Which means, why are you crying, you know, um, you must, you're, you're a boy, tough it up, you are a boy, be tough about it. So throughout the years, we are learning that we are not supposed to cry. We're not supposed to show emotions. We're not supposed to even communicate, which goes back to what happened with us. Because we are told to, to, to fix things and we are supposed to be the breadwinners. We're not supposed to express and show emotions, except when we are having women, you know, because we're also cultured to have not, not a one burner lifestyle. We're supposed to have girls in bungles, yeah? So we are cultured into being tough. And so you say you supposed to have girls in what? In bundle, Bung. bundles, bundles. Yeah. bundles. bundles. Yeah. We, we yes. say, we say, so we say bundles mean something different. <laughs> bundles no, mean a lot, different. a lot of women, so, a lot of women. Yeah, so it means we should have, they should have a lot of women. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we we don't cry. You know, there was a time in my life when I didn't cry for a whole year. Um, Watching your mom go through Especially that because of mom. I was crying over the years, going through university, high school. And then I decided that this wasn't fixing anything. So why cry? I was crying out to God. I, I took it to him. There were times when I went to church and nothing on my mind but mom. And I come to the altar and I'm praying. And nothing happened in my view. So for the year, I said, I'm not going to cry. And I became cold. I became bitter. I just was out of it. And so you were dating this young man while he was feeling all these internal emotions that he wasn't communicating. And what did you feel in that moment? I know you said you felt like there was nothing you can do to help him. He's not even telling you what's wrong. What did you think? Did you think he just wasn't serious about you? No, I never felt like he wasn't serious. But I often said to God, okay, why, why did you have to put me in such a tough situation? You know, he gave me this cross. Like, this is, I don't know, I'm not sure if this is my cross, you know? I'm not too sure. And I remember going to somebody that I admire, my, one of my spiritual friends, and she said to me, just walk away. This is somebody I trust. This is somebody who I take counsel from. This is somebody who I have known since I was a child. She said, just walk away. This is not your cross. The same thing I was thinking. She said, this is not your cross. You can get, I mean, you can get anybody, you know? You're a pastor's daughter. You can get a bishop's son. You can, you know, get an artist. You, you know, the whole works. But in my heart, because I knew that he was my husband, and I think that's why God gave me the confirmation very early, because he knew that I would have met upon these roadblocks. So he had to tell me early on that, hey, hello. Yeah, that's your husband. And so for me, I felt like, in times when I wanted to give up and walk away, I was reminded of God saying to me, literally, like, it was the first time I was hearing the voice of the Lord so clearly. And I'm like, yes, God, I'm here. I'm listening. I'm listening. And he said, that's your husband. So what did you tell her? I told her, I'll think about it. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> I told so her, I'll think about it because I did not know what to say in that moment. Did you tell her the confirmation that you heard from God? No, I didn't tell anybody. You just kept that to yourself? I kept that to myself. Why? Because I, again, I did not want anybody to pressure him as well. So I kept that to myself. And I, I knew that I wasn't going to pressure him. So I didn't tell him and I didn't tell anybody around me or him because I did not want anybody to just happen to say, she got her confirmation already. What are you waiting on? No, I didn't want that for him. And I didn't want that for me. And I didn't want that for our marriage. And so I kept that to myself. And I told her that, Probably like a few months later, I wasn't going to walk away. And she said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> yeah. right. and, I, and I think it's so important because over the years, when you are told something or it has an impression on your mind, sometimes you go to God in prayer and you think you have a clean slate. But because of what is impressed on your mind, you're praying and you're getting the answer, which is not the answer from God, but because it's in your heart and it's in your mind. Yeah. So I think it was so important that she didn't say anything to me.
we got to be very careful about who we seek counsel from. Because some things that God tells you, it's almost like asking Noah. Did Noah have to go ask people like, hey, do you think God really wants me to build this ark? You know, sometimes God tells you something that he didn't tell nobody else. And that's why I say we got to be very careful, too, who we seek advice for, especially when it's talking about relationship. Because that person, you know, and I, I believe she meant you well. Yes. But is that that they can project their own experiences on you and say, well, now nah, I was in the same situation. So I'm telling you, walk away. And they'll actually encourage you to walk away from your blessing. Yes. And you got to be very, very careful from that. And I really uh, I honor you for the, fa- for, the, for the mere fact that you said, you know what? You went back to that before place. I heard God say this. So this cross is just the cross that I have to bear. Um, and what's so interesting about it is that a lot of times we're, you know, we, we're convinced that doing things God's way is the easy way. You know, we look at, well, if I'm honoring God, I'm, I'm keeping my body holy. We're not having sex. We're in ministry. We're doing this. And surely this should be easy. You know, your body is doing what your body doing, craving what, what it's craving. His body's craving whatever it is. And uh, you're, y'all are meeting adversity. So what happened? How did it switch from y'all dating for four years to him saying, hey, will you marry me, Brian? Uh On the point that you just made, I think it's important that we also understand that there are crosses that God wants us to carry. It was divinely put for her because if she had taken on somebody else's, maybe she wouldn't be here today. You know, maybe she would have been in a situation where she regretted it. How did it transition? (laughs) Talk about it, Rochelle, again. She may regret it. No, no, I mean, I mean, literally. We heard you, we heard you. (laughs) You loud and clear. We, we know God doesn't make accidents, right? He has a plan. So even though the person was looking out for her, not wanting her to bear the cross, it was her cross to bear, and I thank her for helping me to bear it. So, yeah. so the transition for me, it was it was pretty straightforward because we were we were great friends. We we spoke about everything. So when I told her I got my confirmation, it was pretty much yeah. It was pretty much <laughs> she getting happy all over again. We, we became Usain Bolt and Asafa Powell, straight to the, the, the finish yeah. line. So you said, but you said five years. So how did it go from five years to we about to do this now? Well, I just told her this is my confirmation. I planned out how to pop the question. I he, got her. He staged the whole yeah. car theft situation. I got everybody around her yes. involved: her sister, her brother, <laughs> and and we turned up one Saturday morning early. It was her birthday, and uh, she was sleeping. I know she sleeps late to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we got there and we pushed her car out in the driveway. We opened the doors, we ransacked it, we pushed her brother's car out, we ransacked it, we threw money on the ground. And so dramatic, yeah, like. <laughs> yeah. Her sister woke her and said, come, With come, tears come. in her eyes. Yeah. It looks <laughs> like they were trying to break in the car or steal the car. And I ran outside in my night clothes. With I her did mouth not, water. Yes, and, yeah. and matter in my eye. And, you know, morning breath. I didn't have had on my niece's slippers. My niece was one at the time. I just kind of, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what I was doing. But when I ran outside and I'm trying to call Brian and I'm not getting him. And I started getting upset with him because I always said to him, when I call you, you need to answer. Take your phone off. Silent. Up to this day. Time. Right? <laughs> Brian, up to this day. She up said, to Brian. this day. And so I, I tried calling one of my police friends, but Brian knew that I would have called that police friend. He knew that I would have called him. And I called him and he's like, all right, we're on our way. I'm like, okay. So I'm there waiting, waiting, waiting. And I hear this car blaring down the road. So I'm like, the police is coming. And when, when the car drove up, I was still upset because I'm on my phone trying to get Brian. And I'm, by this time, I was sending him messages like, you see, you see what I always tell you when there's going to be an emergency, I won't be able to get you. And then I heard this loud music coming out of the car. And I'm like, why does the police have this loud music so early? And he opened the door and I heard the song, been together for a while now. Yeah. <laughs> John and Legend. I'm like, okay, it still didn't click because I'm upset. My car is out in the road. And then I saw him come out of the back of the car. And I'm like, why is he coming out of the back? It still didn't click. I'm like, why is he coming out of the back of the car? When he came out, he had like the most beautiful bunch of white roses. It still didn't click. I'm like, then they're trying to steal my car. <laughs> he knew. He knew that doing it early in the morning would throw me off because when you wake me up early out of my sleep, I don't know what's happening, right? And so, 
<laughs> That's our word today, to this day. And uh, he came out and he had a placard and the placard said, happy birthday. And I'm like, oh, but they're, they were still trying to steal my car, you know? And he turned it around and it said, will you marry me? And that's when I got the message. And yes, we Water got married. Did yes. you break down crying? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. cried. Yeah. She, was, she was hollering, yeah. <laughs> she, she came out looking disheveled. And trust me, she got like, more disheveled. I was like, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Glory. And here we are almost 10 yeah. years later. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah, and we also have, we also have two beautiful girls, Bria Marie, Marie and, and Bella Renee. Renee. Yeah. yeah I, think it, I think it takes a brave man to propose to a woman who is in her nightgown and yeah. looking all yeah. disheveled. And yeah, all, all of the guys now doing these elaborate things, you know. Ours was elaborate, but, you know, if I could marry her looking like how she did, then, you know, same, I got this. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of women would be a little upset about that the picture because they'd be like, "You didn't make yeah. I didn't cute. I need my pictures. Yeah. My nails got to be done. Yeah. I got to have the right pictures were go. not cute." There you go. There you go. They were not cute. So you could not put that. Did you record it? Yes. Uh, interesting story. We recorded it. It was a friend in the mango in the tree mango tree recording, recording it. Yeah, yeah. It was a whole production. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're in media, so it had to be a production. It had to be a production. Um, I need that video. Y all, y all have <laughs> That's the thing. We, we, can't, we can't find, find it. it. We can't find can't the video. No, because we didn't, we didn't know about cloud, cloud storage at and stuff time, at that yeah. time. It's been a while. It's been a while. And so it's like we lost the video and I'm like, uh, but we have each other. So that's, that's right. most important. That would have been hilarious. I would love to see him in the tree. <laughs> yeah. Mangoes. Yeah. 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 Hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. I was going to make y'all go viral. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be hilarious. Yeah. And so what made you decide that way? Like to make a to introduce a crime into your proposal. What, what, <laughs> what made you What made you do that, Brian? It It was just so that she wouldn't have a clue what was happening, you know. Yeah. So it, it had nothing to do with nothing else. <laughs> It was just so that I could get her surprised. And we're in media. I specialize in radio. He specializes in TV. And so, you know, because he's a TV producer, That's right. you know, he had to be extra with it. And, you know, I just want to point out that even when I was excited about getting married and I was happy that he had proposed, I enjoyed being single. And I want people to understand that singlehood is not a disease that you cure with marriage. Uh-uh. It's not. It is not. I, I don't know where the notion came from that, you know, you need somebody to make you complete. I tell Brian all the time, and when people say it, oh, your other half, I'm like, no, he's my other whole. Because he had to be whole yeah. to compliment me being whole. Yeah. And I enjoyed being single, and I enjoyed my season of singlehood. I just got up and went as I liked. I could get to know myself a little bit better, and I could also work on the person who I wanted in my husband. And what I mean by that is, you know, you pray for a praying husband, but if you can't pray, who is he going to pray with, you know? So I had to also work on who I was asking God for. I had to ensure that I was prepared and ready to be the wife that I was praying for to God for, you know, what I wanted in my husband. That's good. That's yes, good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's good. You said singleness can't be cured by marriage. No. I love that. That right there is a tweetable moment. Um, what about you, Brian? You were about to say something. Yeah, I was thinking about you. When we spoke, you know, I said to you, one of the things that dropped in my street while I was talking to you was about that, the fact that we need to take the makeup off of marriage. And it went back to even us when we got engaged. Now I'm thinking about it, that we started without the makeup on. And to this day, we are transparent and you know, keeping in tune with what you're about. Because the whole thing she just spoke about, a lot of times we have this concept about marriage that is not the truth. You know, especially, yeah, as young people, the IG posts, the Snapchats, the marriage is a whole lot of work. And, you know, I joked about it that I, I, I proposed to her when she was without makeup. But every single day we get up, there is no makeup in this thing. You know, the wedding, the wedding was where the makeup is, but the life that we live every single day is where the ministry is. And I think a lot of people forget that marriage is a ministry, and that is why it's a misery for a lot of them. 
Brian over here preaching, ain't he? <laughs> Brian, you said marriage is a ministry. How? Yeah, all right. So I, I want people to understand, and I think a lot of times we try to have a marriage that is pretty for the people versus a marriage that is in purpose with the will of God. And, and we end up in misery instead of in ministry because we have that misconception. Hold on, hold on. You can't just let that just sit out there. Y'all know, y'all know one of my hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up moments. You said we end up in misery and not in ministry. How do we end up in misery and not in ministry, Brian? For me, the, the first thing about getting married wasn't to please people or to please even myself. You know, I tell people that marriage, when I, when I MC weddings or when I'm asked to, to, to offer counsel because I'm not a counselor, I tell people that marriage is a birth and a death. A lot of people don't want to hear that. Yeah. I die, she dies, and we are born on the same day. why that is why I married him yes it's here yeah, that's that's why he's my husband that's why I married him thank you <laughs> yeah I, I've come a far away from that that young man who was just so confused and and I've learned a lot from God in this walk in 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 this ministry it ministers to us as individuals first and then it ministers to those we come in contact with this is this is something that i'm doing not to please anyone but to honor god so every everything every disagreement we have every argument i'm thinking about all right god is not pleased with this yeah so i have to apologize to her i have to make us right not because even pleasing her i need to please god um you're about to make me run, Brian. I'm about to run all, <laughs> run all the way back to Dallas, fooling with you. Um, y'all were married for 10 years, but your marriage wasn't a cakewalk. Uh, y'all met adversity. Uh, let's talk about that. Um, at what year of your marriage did y'all start facing obstacles and challenges? A year and a half in, and I was, I was like, God, really? So quick, you know, we need a, a longer, a longer honeymoon, honeymoon phase. Period, yeah. And, you know, when Brian spoke about marriage being a ministry, I knew that God had to allow us to, us to go through all that we were going through in order for us to be here today and be able to share our story and to share with others. For them to know that, hey, you're not alone and you can go through it as well and come out victorious. And for me, a year and a half in, we changed jobs. So he went to a TV station and I went to another radio station. However, they were in different parishes. Like in the States, you have different states. They were in different parishes. And it was fine at first because my schedule was very flexible. And so I could leave home after sending him off to work. We had it all planned out. It felt so good. Went to work. I come back home and everything. By the time he got home, I was there already with dinner, the whole works. And then we got pregnant. Found out we were pregnant one week into the new job. And I realized very quickly that I could not do the traveling because we were like one, two parishes away. I realized I couldn't do the traveling. Give us a uh, context. How far is that as far as uh, An hour and a half. Out? Hour and a half. Okay. Yeah, hour and a half. But what happened for us was about three, four months into the pregnancy, my car broke down on the highway. My battery died. And I was alone being pregnant, and that was a scary experience. The parish that I had the job in, it was in Mandeville. Manchester is the, is the parish, and Mandeville is the town. I was in Mandeville, that's where I was from, so my parents were still in Mandeville. So I said to Brian, we discussed it, and we decided that, all right, we are going to allow me to stay down during the week and come up on the weekends. But as the pregnancy progressed, I could not even manage to go up on the weekends. And so it ended up being a situation where we lived apart for three years of our marriage, three long years. 
And in those three years... Y'all lived apart three years and y'all were an hour and a half away yeah. from each other. Yeah. We yes. had a visiting relationship. <laughs> <laughs> because his schedule, his schedule was crazy. He was in media. He would leave work at 11 p.m. It wouldn't make sense for him to come to Mandeville. By the time he came to Mandeville, we would be asleep and the whole works. And so our schedules pushed us to literally seeing each other once for the week. And uh, that was not enough. That was Y'all not enough. Y'all just uh, basically met up for conjugal visits. There you, you know? go. Visiting, <laughs> visiting relations. And, and, and let me tell yeah, you, yeah. let me tell you, not even that used to happen sometimes because we started growing apart. And I became absent emotionally. So I see him come and I don't want anything, you know. It's okay. Hi, how are you? Mm, nice to see you. Okay. When are you going back? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yes, it got to that point where I was emotionally absent because then I started to become resentful of him because I'm like, I'm here. I am pregnant. I am doing all my doctor's visits by myself. I am here by myself. You're not here with me. This is our first pregnancy. You're not here. And then he used to tell me things like, oh, I'm going bowling with my friends. Oh, I'm going to play football. Oh, I'm going to swim. I'm like, okay, and I'm chopped liver. Okay, right. So I'm, I'm at home, you know, and then when we had the baby, it was the same thing. I had her by myself for two years before we lived together again. So by that time, I was cold. I was very cold. I was full of resentment, and I felt like a single mother, and that's why I say that marriage is not a cure for singleness because you can be married and single. You can be married and feel single. And in those years, I felt like a single mother and I resented him. I did not want to see him. I did not want him to come down. I did not want him to come and disrupt, you know, my way of life because no, I became independent Basilia again. And I think it is so dangerous when you are married and you get back to that place because by then I no longer felt like I need my husband. I didn't feel like I needed him anymore. And so it was tough and it was tough on him because I, again, I didn't understand what he was going through. Did you communicate that through those three years? Hey, I need you here more. I need, you know, this is what I need. I'm going through this pregnancy alone. Now the child is born. We need to, we need to change up something. Did you communicate that? I did at first, but then when I realized that the situation wasn't changing, I decided, okay, well, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this by myself. I don't need to ask for anything. I don't need to. And you know, when, when, when us as women, when we get to a place where we can financially support ourselves. It's a wrap. Yeah, it's a wrap. Yes. We, we, we don't need to ask for anything. We're not in need of anything other than a little, mm -hmm, right? <laughs> When we get to that place, it's like, okay, well, I can do bad all by myself. Yep. So that's the place that I got to. And then because he did not he wasn't communicating to me how he was feeling and how he was grappling with being away from us. All I could see was him enjoying himself like a single man in Kingston, having the time of his life, about him going to movies. Yes, and I am home with the baby. And so because he did not communicate that to me, I did not know that he was also struggling. What were you going through, Brian? Boy, I was being torn apart. Um, I, I remember, as I told you, my dad left, and I wanted to ensure that I would never leave. And I so saw you became it, just like I your father. I became exactly what I hated and resented because I resented my father for years. And it's so funny that you try so hard to not become something that you become. Yeah? And Hold on, Brian. I got to jump in. It's the same thing that happened with me. Yeah. My dad... Uh, and he'll never admit this this very day, but my dad used to cheat on my mom all the time. And I was like, I'll never do that. I'll never cheat on my wife. And then I became everything that I despised. And I hated myself when I became that because it was the very thing I was trying to run away from, I ran to. Yeah, yeah. And, and that tears at us when we realized what was happening. So in order for me to cope, I had to do things because in my head, and this is so important that we understand that even in marriages, you have two different individuals and they're on two different roads, but we always tell ourselves that we're on two different roads heading to the same destination. So we can't lose sight of that. So I knew that she was home with her parents. She had our bundle of joy and I was in a foreign land all by myself. And the only way for me to cope was to do things that 
get my mind off that situation. So when she would send me all the pictures and the videos of the baby walking and the baby learning to talk, and she was helping me in her head, but in my head, I was missing all of this. And it hurt me. That's good, that's good. It hurt me, tore at me. So I had to keep doing things. So when my friends are going to the movies, yeah, I want to tag along because I'm missing out. When, when my friends are going swimming, I'm going to go because if I don't go, I'm going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to lose my mind. Teach Brian, you were yeah. using everything. She think you're doing that for fun. You're That's doing right. it as a coping mechanism. There you go. There but you then go. I didn't know that. Right. Because we I weren't communicating. Because it got so, so contentious that we couldn't have a conversation without arguing. She couldn't see my side. I couldn't see her side. And we were literally turning against each other. Um, but I had to do what I had to do. Because if I didn't, I would have lost myself. And then if I lost myself, I wouldn't have had the fight to continue to fight for her. This is so good. It is, good. It is so good because it's a master class on what relationships truly look like. We're always sold this beautiful wedding, but we don't understand how to really deal with the marriage. This is marriage ministry master class. Because y'all are being transparent and raw and vulnerable, and y'all are unpacking what happens when you start getting back to singleness. Because yeah. at the end of the day, y'all y'all got married, but everything that y'all talking about that caused division was y'all becoming single-minded right. again. That's right. And y'all became single-minded again, and then a single person can operate in a marriage. There you go. It just cannot there operate. You go. And so, like she said, she said, I was getting back to my place like, oh, I could do this on my, on my own. That's you know right. what I'm saying? And then you like, well, I'm doing this as a coping mechanism. And she's feeling like you just out here living your best life. But you're out here doing this so that you can hold a little bit of sanity so that you just That's don't right. lose it all. That's exactly And it. so then you said, if I can just have little moments of adventure, moments to just have fun, get my mind away from something, then I can still maintain a little semblance of hope so that when I really get to managing what this life really looks that's like right. and what my job is doing, I'm going to have a little fight left and I'm yep. going to come back and get my woman. Yep, that's it. That's it. You know, one of the things that pushed us to getting those jobs in different parishes was finances. We wanted to be able to provide more for our family. We wanted to be able to, you know, just live a, a better quality life. Yeah. But then when I look back, we were much happier. During that time, we were much happier when we had little to nothing. Oh, yeah. We used to, we used to sit on the ground and eat We were mackerel, much happier. White rice. You yeah. know, when, when we look at the times when we did have money... In my mind, I'm saying, I want to go back to the times when Before. we didn't have money. Yeah. Because we were happier. We would come home in the nights, and all we had in the cupboard was some tin food. Yeah. And I would cook up the tin food with and candles. light candles. Yeah. And we're there eating dumplings with knife and fork and That's tin right. food. Right. And we were happy. And so we also have to be very careful about how we pursue even wealth. Yep. Yep. Because it comes at a cost. God, y'all trying to make me cry. <laughs> Jesus. Y'all messing me up right now. This is so... Y'all don't understand. I had a lot of people that submitted themselves to be on the podcast. I had... At first, I wanted to have a panel. I was going to have about eight people up here. But I see there was God's design that I just need to talk to y'all too because y'all are filling me up. Y'all are filling this audience up. Y'all are... Oh, Jesus, this is a lot. Jesus. <laughs> So how did y'all get to the place of happiness? How, what happened with your job transition to get back? We got pregnant again. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, conjugal business actually yes. worked, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I think, again, one of the things I, I, I love her for is over the years, she's been protecting me and, and, and cherishing me and praying for me without forcing me. Um, so when, when... Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Brian, how did she pray for you and not force you? You got to break that down. All right, so there's a saying, you can take the donkey to the water, but you can't make him drink. 
There it is. And if you force him to drink, really and truly, he's going to do it. But the minute you, you turn your back, he's going to stop. So he's not getting what he needs to get. So for, for us, we had arguments over the years where I felt like, I'm just going to leave my job. I'm going to come home. And she never yet said, yes, do it. And I realized when we got pregnant the second time and I sat, I, I had to sit and have a conversation with myself. And I said, this is not going to work. My work hours are not going to allow me to have this family life that I want. I remember a story some years ago about a young business ruler who he had it all. And he went to a, a village and he was spending time with the chief and he couldn't understand why they're so happy. They had nothing but um, river water and they lit candles in the night. And he went to the chief and the chief said, why are you doing what you're doing? He said, so that I can be happy. And he said, what do you mean? I want to get a house and a car. And he said, okay, you have your house and your car, then what? He said, then I'll have my business. And he said, and then what? You're going to have businesses and then what? Yachts and touring the world and then what? He said, then I'm going to get married and settle down and have a happy life with my wife. And the chief said, that is what I have. So what he was doing was trying to go through the success route to get to happiness. But happiness is literally something else. <laughs> and you know, exactly how, <laughs> exactly how our journey started where I decided that I would not tell him about my confirmation from God. During those rough times, I did not want to force him to, to come because I knew that if he didn't want to come, then I, it was just a slippery slope. I wanted him to want to be there with us. Yeah, because, and, I, yeah. Yeah, because I would be home. If she forced me to leave my job, I'd be home miserable. I would be, every time I think about my job, I'd say, you see how you let me leave my job? Yeah, but when I thought about it. I weighed the pros and the cons. And when I went to my boss and I told her, she said, for a young man, that's a mature move. She said, that is a, not the popular move, but she believes it's the right move. And there were so many persons who came to me after that when they found out why I was leaving and they said to me, they wish they had done that in their younger years. Because a lot of them, their profession ruined their marriages. And it's interesting, it's interesting because I got that, that sort of validation or, or support. But then when we made it public, because we're, we're in the media, so we're in the limelight. When we made it public, I was trolled. We were dragged. I was dragged for leaving my job for a woman. How stupid could I be? They said he was leaving his job to come and watch me. He was leaving his yeah, job. Yeah, because I'm insecure. Yes, and, you know, I was probably there, pretty forcing woman, him. you know, forcing him and doing my own thing. But they did not need to know. Right. They didn't need to know. Right. It's and, not about them. Yeah, it's not about them. And, you know, during those three years, as resentful as I was, as upset and sad as I was, you could not, there's not one person on this earth who could say that I ever spoke badly of my husband. I covered him in every sense of the word. When people would make suggestions like, why is he so close to that coworker? Or why, you know, why is he, you know, spending so much time with, you know, little suggestions. I would, I would nip it in the bud. I did not entertain these conversations as much as I was hurting on the inside because I understood the importance of covering him, of covering our marriage, because you see, when you have a public, public, you know, spat or anything, when you forgive your husband and move on, the public, the public is going to remember and they're going to say, mm-hmm. Yes, look how she gone back to him after all they went through. And so I was very big on making sure that I covered him. And you know, when you spoke about seeking wise counsel, I know sometimes persons would say, oh, don't tell your parents your problems or don't tell your mother because when your parents, your parents will take your side and they will forgive you but not him. But I knew that I could get wise counsel from my mother. Yeah. I went to my mother in times when I was giving up. And by the way, I gave up in my mind several times because as women, we can leave you without leaving you. Hello? <laughs> and so I gave up. I gave up. And when I went to my mother this year, my parents will be married for 40 years. They've been married since they were very young. And I remember one day, Brian came home. And because I didn't want to see him, 
I gave him the baby and I went into my mother's room looking all pretty. So when I went into my mother's room, my mom said, what happened? She said, I said, oh, Brian is here. You know, I'm ready to watch TV with her. She's like, okay, Brian is here, go. I'm like, no, I want to stay with you, mommy. And she's like, no, I'm not your husband. Go to your husband. And I'm like, but we're not getting along. She said, okay, then find a way to get along. And I found every excuse in the book. And she said, at the end of the day, he's the one you said I do to. And you're going to go and try and fix it. She said, even if it means sitting in the same space in silence, go. Yes. The lady run me. She said, go, go. And I went and sat in silence in the corner. I didn't want to talk to him, but at least we were there. But I knew I could get great counsel from her because she was on the side of our marriage and not on my side. So I love that. Y'all messing me up, I swear y'all. <laughs> I'm doing every bit, everything in me, not to just lay on this floor and just cry. Because I'm telling you, this is so beautiful. And like you said, you'll go from being the steadfast, unmovable woman of God to, hell. Oh, I, I was about to give up several times. I was going to do this, I was going to do that, which shows the humanity of Christianity. I believe that Christianity has a humanity attached to it. Even Jesus Christ, when he was about to go on the cross, right, he right. said, God, take, take this yeah. cup from me. Yeah. I don't want to die. That's the humanity of our Savior. And so often we, we sell this Christianity thing as, oh, we get it all together. I can't voice my, my faithlessness because I'm a person of faith. I can't ever talk about the place where I was hopeless come on, come because on, I'm supposed to be a person who's always been hopeful. And so I love the fact that y'all are saying, listen, no, I was steadfast and unmovable. I'm hearing these people whisper, saying, oh, he got this side chick. He probably got this, he got that. you like... If I feel it, you ain't going to know I feel it. At the end of the day, I'm going to take this to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to talk to my husband about it, but you'll never see a chink in my armor. You'll never see a chink in my armor. And that's what's so beautiful about being someone that is protecting your marriage. And that's exactly what made him come to the, the resolution and the resolve within himself to say, my wife would pray for me in my absence. My wife would keep me covered. And that word, we don't use that enough, is covering. Yes. Is covering. Is covering. I want that to resonate all on these YouTube streets. Covering. <laughs> is to be able to cover our spouses because that's absolutely important. And so you walked away from your job. You said that you would hear people, uh, a lot of rhetoric, talk about how dumb you were on doing that. Did y'all ever come out socially and combat that and talk about your story? Not, not like that. No, no, not like that. We just continue to live our lives. See, hold on, hold on. That's good right here. That's good. That's good. That's good. I was hoping you said that. Because this is a quote that God gave me in 2018. Mm. He said, let your character outlive their life. Come on, yeah. come on, Amen. come on. What that means is that people are going to talk. People are going to say whatever they're going to say. They talked about Jesus. So why do we think that we're more honorable or more valuable than Jesus? That they ain't going to talk about us. Right. But you said we kept living our lives. We let our character outlive their life. And look what God did. Amen. God put Amen. you on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Amen. 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 345,000 subscribers that will hear your story the way you wanted to tell your story. And so now they'll watch the whole thing and be like, I'll be doggone. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those people that was Come talking on. bad about Come on. And then God will vindicate you in the there place of go. people trying to persecute there you. Go. you. Yeah. Yeah, he fights our battles. Talk, talk, talk. So uh, you came back home. Now uh, you walked away from all the money. Then what did you? What job did you take in order to try to provide for your family? Well, for a couple of months, I was a house husband. <laughs> And that in itself comes with challenges. And humility. And humility, especially in a Jamaican context. Um, you know, as, as I said, we we're supposed to be the breadwinners and I was home. Yeah. Um, but what made it, and again, it's so important. There's, there's always something I say that we have the world versus word phenomena. And we try to please the world versus the word. And I was at home washing the dishes one morning. Hold on, you can't just run past that. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you ain't going to just keep running past these... Gyms, you uh, dropping. We're Jamaicans. We run fast. You got to keep I up. I know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to Usain Bolt this thing. I'm trying to. 
I'm trying to keep up. You said we try to please the world and not the word. Yeah. And the difference is just an L. That's right. That's right. And you take an L when you try to please on, the world. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to preach right now, but go you ahead, to go ahead. something. So, Brian, go ahead and <laughs> go ahead and tell your story. Yeah. Um, I realized I got the W when I was washing the dishes and my daughter, who was two years old at the time, she came out and she saw me and she said, Daddy, you're here. And she ran and she hugged my leg. And I just started crying because she would wake up most mornings not seeing her dad. And that morning when she saw me, it, it concretized it in my heart that I had made the right decision. I didn't care about what anybody wanted to say. I knew this was for my family. This was honoring God. And that is the most important thing. And you know, one of the reasons why we did not share our story immediately for quite a few years was because we also had to go on a healing journey. And for us, we could not talk about what we were going through until we got to a place of being healed. Because you don't want to invite the public into, you know, into what you would call your mess while you're trying to make a, get a message out of it. You don't want to invite, you know, any attention into that. So we made sure. And when we, when we got back together in terms of living together, it was like we were getting married all over again. It was a whole readjustment process. I'm like, Lord, what is this now? It was a whole readjustment process, and it was a little bit more difficult this time around because no, we had, we had two children yeah. in the picture. So I'm trying to be daddy, and I'm trying to be husband. Husband, and yeah. he's trying to now come and be daddy, and you know, trying to make his mark. And I'm like, uh, uh, stop it right there. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah. I did all of this my way for two years, so this was a very sore point of us yeah. getting back together. I'm like, I did this by myself, hello, thank you, for two years. You can't just come and be like, oh, I want it done this way. I'm like, no, sir, yeah. not, not like that. Yeah. Not like that. Draw your brakes. You know, and so I had, to, I had to learn how to be a wife again. I had to learn how to submit again. I had to learn how to lean on him again. Oh, you said a cuss word. You said so. Yeah, <laughs> cool. come on. We do not come curse on. on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Yeah. You use profanity. Yeah. You said submit. Yeah. Why is submission important? You know, I submit to him as he submits to God. There it is. Nothing else you got to say. Full that point, it's a wrap. And that's the best way I can explain it. And, you know, one of the things I always said to him is that he didn't force me into submission. He loved me into submission. And that for me was just amazing because I did not have a husband who came and demanded that I fall in place and I, you know, get in place. You're my wife. You're, you submit to me. He was very gentle. He was very patient. He made sure that that emotional connection that I had lost that we, you know, started to spark the fire again. But then it was so much more difficult because we had children in the picture. But we learned how to live together again. Listen, love, love is, love is a not whole lot pain, of work. <laughs> pain free. A, a lot of times we, we, again, go back to the makeup and the marriage. We romanticize love. And, and the truth is love is a lot of hard work. Love has a lot of pain. Love has a lot. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave everything. He gave everything, and, and I knew I got gold, or platinum, whatever, whatever the highest thing is out there. And I, I couldn't afford to lose it. So even when I made her upset and I knew that she was drifting and she was apart, I was conscious about how I go about getting her back to love me. So you said something important a while ago, uh, Basilia talked about getting to a place where y'all protected what y'all had before y'all can actually combat the naysayers. Um, and while, while you were saying this, God gave me this beautiful analogy about the process of healing when you get a scar or a cut. Uh, yes. The very first thing that they do, if you keep that cut exposed, what happens? You get a, an infection. An infection, an infection can true. set in because now you're getting all this outside stuff uh, into it. 
uh, and the first thing that, that happens is they'll cover up. They'll cover up the, the, the wound. And so what happened was y'all said, let's cover each other. So we're going to go ahead and protect this thing right now until we get the proper healing. And then the last stage of healing is when you take off the Band-Aid and now you're able to, to expose it. And so that's what's so beautiful of what God actually did in y'all's marriage is that now y'all are exposed, y'all healed. People can say whatever they want to say. You be like, hey, I'm standing beside him. Uh -huh. she, he's saying, hey, listen, this is the most precious thing, whether it's gold, platinum, diamond, whatever. <laughs> she is all that and then some. So I had to do everything in my power to get her back because he knows that you are his purpose partner. You know that he is your purpose partner. And no matter what y'all went through, y'all do life better with each other than apart. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, so y'all been married for 10 years. Um, when is y'all's 10 year anniversary or 11 year anniversary? January 4th. Correct. You guys can look at that. <laughs> Who's going good at first? You guys yes, yes. January 4th will be 10 years. January the 4th, 10 years. And um, also, this coming up January will be 10 years. Yes. Okay. So y'all be 10 years. What y'all plan on doing for y'all 10 year anniversary? We want to go to Dubai. That's the plan. I can't wait to travel. We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah. There it is. Um, so you're going to try to honor in that? Yeah. Um, I also want to, to renew our vows. We want to renew our vows. So that's something that we're aiming for. Most importantly for me, I lost the ring. Or original, or original wedding ring. wedding ring. So I, I want to get that back. I mean, something better, of course. But... Um, yeah. <sighs> I just, what, what was this on our finger right now? No, yeah, it's, it's a wedding. A yes, it's a one, right? temporary one. <laughs> but he still feels bad about losing the original yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, he lost it, not me. Just want to point that out. Thank you. <laughs> Accidentally, it fell in a part of our car that we could not get it out. Yeah. We couldn't get it out. And so, I mean, over the years, honestly, I'm just so happy I have the man. The ring can go. I'm just so happy. <laughs> I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. And you know, one of the things that Brian and I have always maintained is that going forward, now that we know that certain decisions can lead to certain things, we're not going to allow certain things to happen again. So even if, if they're paying me a million dollars US, yes, I have to say it in US, a month <laughs> to come and do a job, if my husband and my family can't come with me, I am not taking that risk. I, I can't take that risk. Yeah. There's a and, thing. There's a saying yeah. that absence makes the heart grow fonder. But there's a part that I heard that it stuck with me that presence strengthens it. So when you're absent, you're missing. But when you're together, that love be growing. Yes. So so there are certain things. Yeah. There are certain things that we won't do again. And we're not saying that persons need to follow the same path. We just know what works for us, and we are going to do what's best for us and for our marriage and our relationship. I, I, I couldn't have imagined that we would have gotten to 10 years. I'm like, holy Jesus, hallelujah. I can't believe, but I'm so grateful to God because I think even during that process, this was my test in my Christian walk because I had, a, I've always said this, I had a great upbringing. My father was a pastor. I grew up in church, you know, not used to much. You know, you go to church, you go home, you're living holy, you're feeling good, having your own conviction. It wasn't until marriage that I really understood God a little bit more for my, a whole lot more for myself. And so I think God is so intentional about the things that he allows you to go through and you can either break or get better from it. And I'm so happy that we are better for the experiences that we had. Listen, y'all made me better just listening to y'all today. This, yeah. I thank God for y'all. I thank God for being so intentional. I thank God for even connecting me with, I can't wait to travel for them to have the vision to say, hey, listen, uh, you know, I want to do an influencer trip with you. And I said, well, if we do a, a trip, I got to do my podcast there. He said, well, we never done that before. I said, well, let's do something new. <laughs> and so uh, Jamaica is our number one market for relationships uh, on Apple Podcasts. So I had to show y'all love, which is also, I plan on coming back here July the 15th. I plan on coming to Jamaica July the 15th to Kingston so we can do a live podcast recording for the locals because a lot of the locals were DMing me saying, how you gonna come to Jamaica and yeah. you not 
show us no love. Like, what is this about? Like, why would you even think about that? So I felt really bad. So I said, we're going to go to, we got to do a whole new uh, trip where we're just going to come out, uh, the podcast. Uh, we're going to just come out here and do a live podcast recording in Kingston. Uh, we'll find guests for that. And so guests that I choose for this, y'all got to be as amazing as the cuss. Amen. I got to be amazing. I got amazing because they are absolutely awesome. Hey, y'all give it up for the cuffs, y'all. So, so what we're going to do now is open up the mic. The mic is in the back there. Uh, come give a question, comment, uh, whatever you like to share. Um, don't come give a whole testimony. Make it about... <laughs> Make it about 60 seconds and ask your question. Come up to the mic and ask your question. Yeah. <laughs> Introduce Great. yourself and what city you're, you're from. Uh, my name is Regina. I'm from Daytona Beach. And when you started talking about- she's a prosecuting about... attorney, y'all. She's a prosecuting attorney, just so y'all no, know. I'm, uh, no, no, I'm a defense attorney. I'm a defense attorney. <laughs> yeah, you defense. <laughs> uh, don't put me over there. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm a future judge. I'm calling that. There it is. All right. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, when you start talking about how your car, they, you were mimicking the car being stolen, two weeks ago my car got stolen. So I'm sitting over here having some traumatic <laughs> situation. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hearing I'm sorry. all about it. I was like, oh, my God. I wish, somebody, I wish that was my situation. But I... <laughs> that's, <laughs> Some man come out and say, oh, marry me. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> but that wasn't the case. I got my car back. But I just want to say, God blesses upon you, too. I just see his favor upon you. I just, and I just love the fact that you did not let the enemy have his way. Amen. That's good. That's good. Anybody else? Come on up. Anybody else? Question, comment. Question, comment. Go ahead, let's form a little line over there so we can. Hey everybody, I'm Russell Lynn from Chicago. Um, I love the fact that you all shared that you all were virgins when you got married. I hear so many uh, negative things about virgins. You know, we're not gonna know how to have sex or you shouldn't date a virgin because they don't know what they're doing. I just want you all to share a little bit about what was your experience like as virgins uh, after you got married. Yeah, when y'all when when had sex the first time. That's what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, so we, we, there was an article that came out because we're very open, as you can see, you know, talking about our experiences. And I want to say, before I answer, I want to say that the fact that both of us were virgins when we got married, we had to be very intentional about how we remained virgins until we got married. And we're not knocking anybody who, you know, has had sex before or you're not on the same path. But for us, that's what we wanted for ourselves. And so we had to be deliberate. And that's a word I use a lot in our marriage. We had to be deliberate. We had to ensure that we did not get ourselves in certain situations. We had to, I always joke and say that on all our dates, most of them, we had a third wheel. We had my brother, my little brother. He was just very excited to come on every date and every trip and everything with us. Free. For free. And for us, that was our accountability partner. And so he was there with us everywhere, even on Valentine's dinner. We go on to the movies. He's right there. You know? <laughs> How old is he? He's a year younger than me. And so for us, we knew that at some point in time, we would be weak. And so we needed somebody there who could, you know, you know, just snap us back to reality. You didn't, didn't have to say, guys, careful, careful, or not no. just, but just the mere fact that he was that there. That he was there, it kept us in line. Yeah. It kept us in line. But being virgins, you know, we have a video on our YouTube channel, Stuff from the Cuffs, where we recount that night. Oh, Father God in heaven. <laughs> so... For us, because we knew nothing else, we had nothing to compare it to. That's number one. We had nothing to compare it to. But the beauty about us being virgins and learning everything together is that literally, we learned everything together. We tried, and what didn't work, didn't work. And who had to cry, cried. And who couldn't figure it out. So it was literally, and the analogy we use is that it's almost as if we were learning to color together, right? So we had a blank canvas, 
And I was the canvas, you were the crayon. Yeah, I got the crayon. I got the crayon. I got the crayon. Yeah. It ain't no coloring outside the land. We got this. We got this. And so it was like a whole adventure for us. We would laugh when we couldn't get it because we're like, oh, Lord, okay, let's go sleep and try this again in the morning. <laughs> let's go try. And, and on our wedding night, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Because I always say that. I hear that a lot. Yeah. Nothing happened. Yeah, we, we went to sleep. We couldn't figure out the, After cr trying, the of crayon could not color prop like, yeah. the, uh, like no, the... No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Let me talk. No, let me talk. Let me talk. Brian, redeem yourself, Brian. Yeah. Don't yeah. let me you out there like that. No. Tell me your crayon don't color. No, no, no. no, no. Like that, the, the crayon was fine. No, the crayon. The crayon, the crayon was fine. But the package that but, the book was in, the canvas. But the, 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 the coloring book, there the coloring go. book there couldn't open. Right, right? right. So the crayon was fine, but the yeah. coloring book was sealed shut. Like, oh my God, in the package yeah. and everything. Yeah, remember my bridging them, I'm going to see this. <laughs> yeah, crayon good. My the yeah. crayon was fine. Yeah. And so, you know, even on our flight after our wedding, I was like, Lord, please don't let the flight crash. Please don't let it crash crash because we have not done anything no please 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 you know and so it was a whole adventure for us and and I loved that we got that with each other after all that we've been through you know I'm happy that we had that little adventure so for us we would say let people talk People have their own opinions, and that's okay. That's all it is, that's opinions. And no, I can proudly say that we have our doctorate yeah. in that department. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, you can get lessons from us. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. But, but I mean, <laughs> even before, I tell people that Adam and Eve, they didn't have no experience. God put them together, and he allowed them to work together to get to where they needed to get. So I knew I believed God. I read. I asked questions. I wasn't ignorant. I just didn't have the practical experience. Yeah? But I made sure to do my research. So when I, when I started coloring, I got this. Love it. Love it. Next question. All right. <laughs> Come on, next question. Introduce yourself. Right. Tilt, tilt the microphone up. Yeah. Tilt, tilt, tilt it up. Uh, okay. All right. Well, that was wonderful, first of all. But um, <laughs> my name is Lynn. I am from Dallas. Um, I'm here with my girl just, you know, trying to be a part. Um, thank you all for coming out and gleaning your wisdom. It is much appreciated. Um, I'm 25, going on 26. I'm very content in my singleness, very strong-minded as well. So I just want to ask you, how did you soften yourself and soften your heart? And make Ooh, that's you, good. That's good. You know. so, so I got married at 25 as well. And I think for me, I understood God's plan for marriage I understood God's plan for me to have a head. I understood the importance of submission. I know, you know, millennials and, you know, they don't like to use that word because I think it's, it's, it's twisted as to how persons perceive what submission is. But for me, how I softened up, I had to be intentional about it. I remember once, because I, I, I can change my tires, I can do everything, you know, because I was single and I was very happy, etc. And I remember one day, Brian and I were somewhere at... Is who get the joke already? <laughs> and, <laughs> and something went wrong with the car. And in that moment, my first instinct was to just fly the bonnet and just do what I needed to do because I knew what to do and Brian did not know what to do. And in that moment, I said to myself, all right, which, let me wait. Do I want to make my husband, you know, do I stroke his ego a little or do I want to get the problem fixed and let's move on? In that moment, I preferred to stroke his ego and to allow him to, you know, try and, oh gosh, Brian tried. And he was there and he was trying and I knew he wasn't doing the right thing and I'm like, go babe, you know, yes, we're going to get this. 
But I think for me, because I knew that he felt bad about not being able to do certain things and not knowing certain things, I had to find certain ways to still make him feel like I am the man, I am the head, I can protect That's you, good. I can, you know, be in control and help my woman out. And so to answer your question, you have to be intentional about it. And I know sometimes as women too, sometimes we make more money than our spouses. And that was a part of our discussions at once because persons would say to Brian, how do you manage her being in the spotlight and possibly making more money than you, etc." At no time do I ever make him feel like he is beneath me because I am bringing in the money. At no time do I make him feel like he's any less of a husband or a man just because That's I good. have had other opportunities to, you know, to make more. And so you have to be very intentional about it. And men, you have to stroke their egos. You have to make sure that they're respected. And you have, again, it falls back to being intentional about what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know as, as a king a lot of people they may look like kings but they're not kings she's never not made me understand and know that I'm the king of the house you know um, I may not be as popular as she is I may not make as much as she does but there ain't no way that hurts me because she's never hurt me she's never let it hurt me and you know on, on the point what you made um, the men have a role to play too yeah, there are a lot of strong, independent, more power to you ladies. But there are a lot of men who are afraid of you. I tell the men all the time, you need to rise to the occasion. Yeah. The, the, the... When, when people found out that we were together because they thought she would be either with an artist or with a, a pastor's kid or a minister, and I would, I would just stand up in the corner and they would be like, oh, is our security, security. that? Security. Or is our driver that? And, and for me, I knew that this was, again, gold, platinum, diamond, whatever. I had to rise to the occasion. And a lot of men were trying with the bravado and the money and trying to, they thought that is how they make her become Teach. submissive and how they win her over. But I knew if I follow God, God will lead me how Teach. to get to her. You see, you see what I have our staff now? All I have to do is step in the room and she just melt, you know? <laughs> and what he said just now is how he has me soft right now. He just has to step into the room and I melt like butter. Yeah, that's, there that's it what is. he said. <laughs> there it is. Next question. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer. I'm a native of St. Louis, Missouri, but a resident of Houston, Texas. There it is. I don't have a question, but I do have accolades I would like to share with you all as your story touched me this morning. And so um, Oftentimes, as we heard in your story this morning, we heard how in scripture, um, a foolish woman tears down her house, but a wise woman builds her house up. And oftentimes, women take on the role of holiness in marriage. But as I was listening to the various transitions in your marriage, the Lord put this scripture on my heart. Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish by holy and blameless. And you probably say, what does all of that mean? We know that God uses the church in the analogy um, in regards to marriage. And so the significance of your story for me this morning was the burden of holiness wasn't on your wife. It actually fell on you because oftentimes people marry with the intent of being happy, but God actually calls us to be holy. So the question with marriage should not be if you want to be happy. Come on. The you question should teach. be if you want to be made holy. And because you chose to be made holy, your marriage exists today. Amen. And so the wise woman was doing her part regardless Jeez. of what her emotions were, right? She was doing her part regardless of what her feelings was, right? And so because she was doing her part, God had no other opportunity because he makes marriage holy is to cause the burden of responsibility to fall back on him. Right. 
So God was able to help you honor your covenant and show up in a place of obedience when you didn't even know what that cost of obedience would be for you. So thank you both so much for showing us Bless a you. display. Bless you. Thank you for showing us everything else is a byproduct of marriage. If you don't want to be made holy, then you don't need to get married. And that's Very really good. what it comes down to. So thank you. You better teach. Bless you. Bless you. I'm going to throw this microphone at you. Let's get the next one. Come on, next one. I love, love the outfit, by the way. He said, he said, yeah, yeah, represent yeah. for Jamaica, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She represents, she represents. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for all the gems y'all have given. Uh, the cuffs, um, the terrorists, man, this is absolutely amazing. So thank you, brother. Uh, man, Brian, you really said some things as a man and as a man that's been married before that I truly honor and I appreciate. One of the things that I have a question about is, though, congratulations on now being the artist after you've worked, opened your crayon box. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm so, so, you know, you guys had three years of your 10-year marriage where you were separate, right? Um, how did you maintain the fidelity of your relationship um, being that far apart after you've already broken the seal of virginity? Yeah. Um, one of the things she made mention of was covering yeah. me, but... I also had to cover my wife. So when I was living elsewhere and I was going to work and whatever, there was never a time that I made it known, especially to the single females. There was a lot of times they would be like, go home to your wife and whatever, whatever. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm going home to my wife. She wasn't nowhere near, but I let them know. And I would always bring her up. I would always understand that, hey, I'm honoring God. So I'm not going to mess this up. I'm not going to mess this up. So I covered our distance. Nobody knew. We didn't tell people. Only persons who were close to us knew. We didn't go out and like, when people would see me out on these adventures, they wouldn't be like, so wait, you're not going home to your wife? I'd be like, yeah, man, when I leave, I'm going home. There was no point in time where I made it known that I'm a quote-unquote single, good. eligible, married man. So. I guess that's called lying with integrity. <laughs> lying with integrity. <laughs> she was always in the room, even when she wasn't in the room. That's good. It makes sense to me. Yeah. What about you, Basilia? Well, for me, I was so busy with a baby. I had no, literally no time to think about anybody else. And, you know, I think, I won't say it's easier for women, but for me, I think it was easier for me because I was so occupied doing so many other things. So I had the baby, I had work, etc. And again, I knew what I had. In that moment, I couldn't see it, but I knew it. And so this is something that we've said before. A lot of times when we hit roadblocks during that time, I had to lean on what I knew versus what I felt in that moment. So that, for, that helped me. And also, I did not entertain any DMs in my inbox. I did not entertain anybody who was trying to slide their way in. I am very blunt, and I don't play about my I marriage. Can't, I can't tell that you're very blunt. I just... <laughs> I didn't, I didn't catch that from you at all. I, I, I know, right? <laughs> I'm very blunt, and one of the things that we did, I, I always spoke about my husband. I always spoke about him like he was right there, right in the car. I'm in the supermarket. Maybe he's outside. You never know. So I always spoke about my husband. I remember somebody coming up to me and said, you know, you can't have, you can't have chicken all day. They're saying, I don't need to have the one man all day. I'm like, yes, that may be your perspective, but guess what? Today we can fry it. Tomorrow we we can curry it. The next day we can brown stew it. The next day we can bake it. Hello. So I was quite content and very vocal about my. You can have it raw too. Oh. <laughs> Come on, bro. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Love it. That's my boy. He's showing up. Jay, thank you so much. That's my boy. That's one of the brothers I said, I called him first. I said, I need you to come out to this because I need as many men as yeah. possible coming yes. out to this stuff. And with a moment's notice, he booked this flight uh, and came out. So shout out to you. Next question. Andre in the building. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if y'all saw their episodes, but Jay was in season two. Was it season two? Season two? Huh? Guard your eyes. Yeah, maybe season two or three. So as, 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 as Jay... Uh, Bradley from Ready to Love, and so, um, so yeah, so y'all have to watch the episode, y'all haven't, and this is Andre Notice, he'll introduce himself, but uh, watch his episode. He was in season 
four, season four. What was the name of your episode? Uh, not ready to love. Not ready to love. The opposite of him. <laughs> he was ready to love. Andre was not ready to love. He said, I, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm single. I'm chasing this bag right now. So we had a whole little thing about that. But go ahead, introduce yourself, King. Yeah, Andre Notice, Houston, Texas. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me to Terrace. Yes. Always a pleasure. Um, first of all, I want to commend you both because what you've displayed here, what you've allowed us to be able to experience from your past experiences, from your, your story, uh, the vulnerability, the honesty, it's something that we all need to hear. And I really believe that your story needs to be showcased on a wide platform. Because the things that you've shared need to be heard from those that are or are not believers. So I'm just here to make sure that you understand that this is just one platform of many. And the things that you've gone, the things that you've experienced, God gave me a title to a book. I'm just letting the spirit flow because I didn't plan to say this. God gave me the title for a book seven years ago. I did not put the pen to the paper until 2021. The title of the book is Your Purpose Is Not For You. So in you going through what you've been through, in you going through these experiences, in your hurt, in your lostness, in everything that you've gone through, it was not for you. And now that you can stand on stage and experience and, and show others what you've been through, so many other individuals will be blessed by the word of your testimony. Because although you went, for, you went through it, you didn't go through it for yourselves. And by you sharing what it is that you've been through, God will be recognized. God will be glorified. God will be glor lifted up because you put him first. And if you put him first, you cannot lose. You. So I commend you and I'll leave you with that. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Andre notice in the building. Come on next. Feel like we're in church. Yeah. Yeah, we're in church. It's testimony time. And <laughs> Hi, I'm Cache. I'm from Ohio. And everything everybody has said so far has been such a blessing. And you guys' testimony is such a blessing. So I just have a few comments. You said that you healed before you spoke on your situation. That really resonated with me because I once heard a prophet say, hush until you heal. And I just thought that that was so amazing and so mature of you guys to uh, do that because we can do more damage from speaking out of and acting out of a place of hurt and bitterness. And so that was really helpful for you guys to do that and to say that and to let everyone know that. Also, um, there was something else you had said and it made me think of in times of trials, it's best to go through with God because if you stay the course and do not abort the process, you always bounce back. And lastly, I want to tell you guys um, congratulations on your upcoming anniversary in advance. And I would also like to sew into your trip to Dubai, if you guys could let me know how to do that. <laughs> and I just, I just want to say thank you guys, because you guys have been an amazing blessing. And I want to yes. say thank you to Laterris, because this podcast is amazing. And I told you yeah, yesterday yeah. that my sister Amen. is hooked on it, and she got me hooked. And you are, have been a blessing to the entire world. So thank That's you. That's right. That's right. Thank you. That's amazing. God bless you. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Rachel Silver. I live in Dover, Delaware. Um, firstly, I definitely want to thank you guys for being on, and thank you for being humble. And first and foremost, humble to God, even behind closed doors. That means yeah. a lot. Um, but you said something earlier about your willingness to leave, and that's something that I hear a lot of the wives on the show say. Um, not only their willingness to leave, some of them did leave, and then they came back together. What did that look like for you? Was it a conversation? Was it a prayer? Was it what did that willingness to leave look like in that? part of your lives. My willingness to leave at what point? Yeah, at which um, point? I think was he dating? came and said he wanted five more years and you said I was oh, willing to leave. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay. Well, for me, that willingness to leave was rooted in the fact that one, I knew that if we had stayed together for five more years, 
we would be would having have, babies. Yes, we would have had a few babies before we got married. Because, and I tell people all the time, yes, we are spiritual beings and we go to church and we speak Hantala Mashanda every Sunday. And we feel good and we jump, but we're also human. And this flesh is no joke. And right? worse, me look good because I look good too. Yeah, yes. yes. That too, that too. You can keep our hands off of <laughs> So my willingness to leave was rooted in one, especially because we were in ministry and we knew that we did not want to mess up. And two, because I knew that he was mine. I knew that even if we left, he would come right back, you know. So I knew he was mine. And I also, but first and foremost, it was the fact that we did not want to step into a situation of, you know, fornication because that's not what we wanted for ourselves. That's not what we wanted for our ministry. And so we were willing to give up the relationship to preserve ministry. Because at the end of the day, it's all about God. Yeah. And let's be real. I was, I was young and dumb. I was young and dumb. Five more years on top of four years. There ain't no way that's happening. But, but when I look back, you know, I've grown. I now understand. As men, we want to have everything figured out. We want to ensure that when we take onto ourselves a wife, she's happy, she's, she's having all the luxuries that exist on, you know, wives, you know, especially when you, you wave your hands in church, it's now your left hand. So I wanted to be able to, yeah, I wanted to be able to have all of those things. But the truth is, if I'm walking in God's purpose, I don't need to worry about those things. The material thing will come if it needs to come. You know, but I, I was putting her in a situation where, because of me being young and dumb, I was telling her that, you know, you need to sit and wait. Yes, when mommy gets better and, and I have accumulated certain things, but the truth is, as men, sometimes we do drag our legs and we make some silly decisions based on what we've been cultured into. And there is beauty in building together. Right, beauty. right. When she told me that, I was like, no, that was grown to build for you when you come into the house. But I don't want to be building with you, yeah. but I've learned. Yeah, beauty in this, building together. What, what I've enjoyed with her, oh, man, oh, man. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Rachel Silver, uh, when y'all hear me, I did about two sessions of this, the lit one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. uh, that's the creator. That, that's the person I, I partner with to create that. Uh, She's amazing. I'm building courses because I don't have the time to be putting all my thoughts into a course. And so she did some Zoom meetings with me. I downloaded what I wanted to be, what, what I want the course to look like and, and information in it. And she just wrote it all out and developed it. So shout out to you, Rachel Silver, for she, being a, I call it a destiny helper. She's my destiny helper. She visited us. Huh? She visited us, visited us next door and she prayed with us. Oh, so we, know, we, we met Rachel. Rachel, you over there praying for Sister people? Sister Rachel. Yeah, pray a warrior. <laughs> That's good. Introduce um, yourself. All right, my name is Tia, and um, I came. Come up to the microphone. I can't hear you. My name is Tia. There you go. And um, I came from Washington D.C., but from the D.M.V. area. Um, so I know. Shout out to the Marylanders out here. <laughs> but I wanted to ask um, Basilia. You had said early on that you got your confirmation from the Lord, and you didn't want to influence His decision, but. <laughs> Were there any moments where you felt like you wanted to send him a Bible verse to kind of help that decision <laughs> along the way or maybe a sermon or something? Oh, yes. Or you weren't so perfect in that moment. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yes. I remember when, before we were together, I was like, what is this man waiting on to make a move? Like, hello? I'm right here. Hello? But, you know, I was not going to be the one to be like, okay, God told me that you're my husband. The green so, light. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I remember one day when we were at work, we were watching this, this poetry on TV. It was Def Jam. Supervisor and... Um, yeah, supervisor and yeah. supervisee, yeah. right? We were, we were watching... We were watching TV at work. TV bosses, at work. Former bosses. Because that's how we... That's how we hung out in the early days. And we were watching this poem, and he was saying in the poem that, how do you know when a woman is interested? Because at this point, I did not know if Brian had a clue, because I'm like, this man is so clueless, right? I didn't know if he had a clue. And it said, how do you know when a woman is interested? She, when she comes over, she leaves a toothbrush, because she intends to come back. When I saw that, I went and I bought a toothbrush. <laughs> And the next day at work, before he came, I kindly put the pink toothbrush right on his desk. <laughs> now, I wasn't going to his house, but I was seeing him at work. 
So I put the pink toothbrush on his desk and I skipped away. <laughs> so when he came and he saw the toothbrush, he was like, oh, oh, oh. So I, I got think, the message. Yes, got he the got message. the message. He got the message that I was interested. And so he, he often says that I quote unquote, looked him, that's what we say in Jamaica. He often says that I, I didn't pursue him, I just, you know, waved the flag to say. Yeah. So, so, so back in the I day, dropped a hint. Yeah, so basically, basically back in the day, what women would do if they had a person of interest, they'll drop a hanky. Yeah. Yes. And then a man would pick it I up. I dropped a go, toothbrush. Hey, you dropped this. You know yes. what I'm saying? Yeah, so you I dropped a toothbrush. modernize dropped a whole toothbrush. A whole toothbrush. Made sure it was pink, too. <laughs> yes. It was all intentional about the color and everything. <laughs> Was yes. A pink toothbrush. Yes. So, so, so that's the hint that I dropped, and then when he finally asked me, you know, do you want to be my girlfriend? I'm like, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you. <laughs> and then 30 seconds later, she said, Sure. She made me wait a little while, man. He waited a little while. What? Like, How long did she make you wait? I, I don't remember, but <laughs> when she told me, long story, when when she told me everything, I was like, So after I made you wait, you made me wait. <laughs> But yeah, I yes. guess I deserved it. So why'd you make him wait? I just wanted him to sweat a little, you know. He's been making me wait, so I'm like, okay. So I, he I didn't make I just, you wait. You made yourself wait. Well, that's true. He didn't even know. He wasn't even. He, he didn't even know, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was probably eight hours. That wasn't so long. It wasn't that long, but I didn't communicate with him. Was over. Yes, <laughs> I didn't communicate with him. And how I knew that he was my husband, and I'll just share this. We had taken some pictures at this popular place called Devon House in you Kingston. You should go to Devon House yes, when you come back. when you come back. It's called what again? Devon House. Best ice, cream ice cream in the in world. The world. Where's it located? Kingston. Okay, so Kingston. when you come back, we'll take you to Devon House, all right? Let's do it. And when we took some pictures, and I was like, Lord, please... Give me a sign. You know, I, I want some sign. I'm like, God, you have to be very clear with me because I want to know. Because I see this little, you know, this little handsome dude. And if he's not for me, then I don't want any part in it. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. And I was willing. And this is also something that is very important. When you ask God for an answer, be willing to hear what he's saying. Because sometimes we're asking God for signing up, but we've already made up in our mind what the answer is going to be. And so I'm like, God, please just show me something. And God literally said, look in your phone. I was looking at my phone. I'm like, okay, what am I looking for? He's like, scroll through the pictures at Devon House. And when I got to the pictures at Devon House, I'm like, okay, what am I looking for? God said, look in the background. I'm like, okay, look in the background. And when I looked in the background, we were standing close to a traffic light. And over our heads was a big green light. And God said, that's your answer. And I held on to that. Boy, I'll be telling you, God, be God, I'm telling you. Test them if you want to. Let's, 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 let's get you up here. Hello, my name is Courtney, and I'm from Atlanta. Yes, AT. My question is for Basilia. Um, when you talked about how your husband was away while you were raising your, your daughter at the time, um, and Try stand in front of the microphone. Yeah. And then when he came back into the picture, um, how did you manage letting him lead the household with you being the main, the solo parent, and you were you had all your parenting styles like this is the way that I want it. How did you let him lead the household? It was a process. It didn't happen overnight. And one of the things that I appreciated about him was that he understood where I was coming from, even while I was trying to navigate how I was feeling. And one of the other things that I also did was I got help. I spoke to a counselor. And uh, I tell people all the time, there is nothing wrong with getting help. I, <laughs> I could not... I could not navigate it on my own, and he was just making it worse, just being there and annoying me. You know, everything he said was like a total annoyance. I got professional help, somebody who 
understood psychology and could walk me through it. And so I think that made the difference because if I had relied on myself, that wouldn't happen. And then too, I had to come to a place where I had to say, God, all right, you have to teach me how to love him again. Teach him how, teach me how to see him as not only my husband, but also the father of my daughter, our daughter, because at one point it was just my daughter, right? And all of those things combined, again, I'll use the word, I had to be intentional about it. And so some days I would just leave the baby with him and allow him to figure it out safely, of course. I would just step away, gladly, you know, get some time off. I would just step away. And in times when he would make decisions that were not necessarily what I wanted, I had to give him grace because he was learning he was learning to be a dad. He was now learning to be a dad to a two-year-old every day. And so I had to just step back very often and just allow him to be there. I remember one day he said to me when I was sort of being rough, and I'd be like, don't do it like that. He's like, babe, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here now. He had to remind me that he wasn't leaving, he wasn't going back to Kingston, that he was here. And so it's not something that you can navigate by yourself. And that's why I'm so glad for the husband that God gave me because he understood what I was going through and didn't try to, to just ask me to just fall in line. Yes. But he was there holding my hand through it all, even though it didn't feel like that sometimes. But he was there just helping me through the process while I tried to readjust. Great, thank you so much. Where's Lisa? Lisa, where's Lisa at? How, how long we have in this room? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Island time. <laughs> All right, we're gonna make these answers real, real quick. All right, here we go. Good afternoon, my name is Sonia. I'm also from Daytona Beach, Florida. My question is, Brian, how is your mother? Yes. Wow. Um, no, you want me to cry? <laughs> um, mommy is a survivor. Um, she's still here. She's not better, not worse. She's still here. And, you know, she loves her. She loves us. Um, so, yeah, she's taking it day by day. It's so interesting that the doctors told us from high school that at any minute my mother could drop down and die. So that was one of the crosses I was carrying throughout my life. Every time my aunts called, my grandmother called, I was like, this is it. So that tore me up every time. And so many of her friends have passed and left her, and it's just a miracle. So she's, she's here. Good, thank you for asking. What's up, brother? Tilt that microphone up. You ain't got <laughs> Take it off the mic stand if you he's want. Go, he, he's going into worship. Yeah, into worship. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Um, I just want to say that I love you guys' story. It's beautiful to hear a couple. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Jason Perry. I'm from Louisiana. I live in Texas. Um, thanks, Latiris, for even inviting me. Definitely. But um, what I want to ask, because I know you guys sound like y'all real Christians and y'all faith is very strong. I want to know, um, it's kind of a two-part question. Like, what was you guys' dating experiences prior to meeting and um, in you guys' social circle? Was being a virgin, like, uh, very prominent to where um, it was normal, normalized, especially living in Jamaica? I'm not really, you know, knowledge about the Christian culture here. Good. All right, so my short answer is, for me, I had a lot of friends who were virgins, both male and female. So it was not, it was not something abnormal. However, on Brian's side, I don't think Brian let anybody know he was a virgin. No, he no, was no, always no. playing yes, it yes. off no, sometimes. No. Was the opposite for in me. In high school, in college. No, listen, I, I, I let them know that I'm a virgin, and I let them know I'm going to remain a virgin. Even when they laughed, even when they said, you know, Jamaicans, we have a saying, we don't buy puss in a bag. We do not buy the puss or the cat without knowing what it looks like and what it can do. And, and my friends, yeah, my friends, I mean, there were people who would come up to me, high school, university, and when I made it, no, 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 I'm a virgin, they'd be like, well, you ain't going to be one much longer. There were females who would tell me, they're the ones who are going to take my virginity. So it what, was pressuring. What I meant was you didn't have a lot of virgin friends. Oh, no. no right. I, I, I was the sore 
thumb out. Yeah. 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 And so they it was w- easier for me. Yeah, than it was hard for me. Him. It was hard. It was hard. I remember I was in a class and a girl had her tongue in my ear. It was hard. It was hard. Yeah, she was, she was, she was you know, yes, determined. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> but, but yeah, so the culture of Jamaica is no, no, no. We, we ain't supposed to be virgins after we reach. I can't tell you the truth because we might get in trouble. But, but the minute we become boys of a certain age, we're supposed to be getting um, stripes on our belts. Um, so it was hard, it was hard. And my circle, on the other part, I had a lot of older Christian friends. So being the young one, I would find a lot of older to get counsel from. So my circle's probably 10 years older than, than I was. You know, I, I put myself in those situations. I used to go on trips, church trips all across the island, every parish in the, in the, because I realized that I said, I put a target on my back by telling the devil that I'm, I'm loud and I'm proud about being a virgin. So I knew I was going to be under attack. So I had to do things that made me get coverage. So I had two spiritual mothers. I had, even when my friends were going to church trips, some of the men, when we go to church trips, we go hunting. Uh, when we go to singles conference, let me, let me look down. A lot of us as men, when we go to single conference, we, we're going not to leave single. We're not going to learn about being single and being happy. We're going to find Philly. We go, yeah. So I, when I would go and they would go cherry picking, I would be going to church. That was my purpose. So I was going to find God to find my wife while they were going to find their wife outside of God. So. You better teach. You better teach. All right. Hello. My name is Cassandra. I'm from Indianapolis, but I live in Houston, Texas. I want to say that I admire your level of commitment to privacy, your private struggles, your private prayers, but we're seeing the public blessing. Can you talk to us a little bit, though, about your friendship in your marriage? Because you hear couples talk all the time, even just in dating. Well, that's my friend. That's my ace. That's my best friend. That's my bestie. I haven't heard you guys. I can sense that there's friendship there. But talk to us about the friendship you have. And thank you again for reminding us how important it is to stay connected to each other and be private. You didn't tell all your girlfriends and all that. My accountability partner is here. Hey, Dee Dee. I talk to her about a lot of things, but I am starting to learn in my relationships and dating that I got to keep some things just for myself. So thank you for that. But talk to us about friendship. In relationship. One of the things that we've always said is that we not only love each other, we actually like each other. So we enjoy being in each other's company. We run up and down, we play yes, hide and seek. Yes, we play, we play a lot, we enjoy doing certain things together and certain things from even when we were dating, we still do know because we find that, you know, this is something that he enjoys or I enjoy. And I remember when I just met him, he was a huge football fan, still is, and I had no clue about football. And what I had to do, I went and I researched and I learned about football so that when he was watching it, I was like, yes, offside, yes. You know, so I was able to enjoy his things with him. And so, you know, just like with any other friend, you want to, you know, be able to enjoy certain things. So you learn, you adapt, and we love spending time with each other. We enjoy doing a lot of different things outside of the married people things. And I tell tell people she's not my best friend. My wife is not my best friend. My wife is my wife. That's another level. That's for me. That's another level. I can have best friends. We laugh, we talk, we play. My wife is my wife. And we like each other, yes. Yeah, I like each other, good. This is the last one? Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Sabrina, and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. I really appreciate the valuable nuggets that you guys have dropped. Um, I want to ask a question in reference to your, um, the dynamic, the family dynamic for each of your households. What was that like um, as far as your mo- the interactions between your mothers and your fathers? Because we didn't hear, we heard, you know, some, some nuggets about your mom and, you know, what happened as far as you making decisions for your, because of what your dad did. But what was that, that, that dynamic between the two parents like? As an individual, no, so what was the dynamic okay. between your mom and your dad? Your mom and dad, and then mm-hmm. separate. What uh, was the dynamic between your mom and dad? Exactly. Yeah. All right. So I think I can answer for both of us. Hers, like they're amazing. Like when I watch them interact and all of that, like her parents, like they're her best friends. Sometimes um, they talk about everything, anything. Lord Jesus, some of the things they talk about, I don't want to be in the room. <laughs> I've never had that type of relationship with my parents. We're from the old school. We grew up not even watching TV. We grew up real, safe, sanctified. Uh, we, I've never heard my mother say, S-E-X, never. If I'm watching a cartoon and they kiss and my mother is in the room, I'm turning it off. So the, the dynamics was really different. She grew up seeing the 
perfect marriage and she grew up wanting to as aspire towards it. I grew up seeing a, a lot of brokenness, a lot of pain, but I wanted to have what she, I didn't know she had. So I made it in, in my heart that I was not going to be like what I grew up seeing. I would have made it different. And I love my parents, but I decided that I was not going to be what they were not. That's amazing. That's all my booty can take. I had to stand up. I can't take it no more. It hurt. It hurt. It hurt. It hurt, don't it? I'm telling you, it hurt. It hurt. So listen, y'all give it up for the cuffs, y'all. Amazing, amazing, amazing couple. Y'all give it up for Lisa and Anthony from I Can't Wait to Travel. Give it up for them. They're in the back right there. They're the ones that made this all possible. We have been blown away by this week with you all, really, really touched. And even though every day has been so great, for some reason this morning was just even more powerful than I ever imagined. I found myself trying to hold back tears. There's just so much love, support, purpose in this room. And we're just so honored to be a part of it, to be on this journey with you, and just to be among all of you. I really feel like we created some form of a family here, and I'm really going to remember each and every one of you. I thank you so much. We thank you so much for coming out. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into Child Protective Services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally, Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This 
is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTerris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. And thank you so much for coming out to I Can't Wait to Travel's trip with Dear Future Wifey. We love you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.